first Wednesday is a night where I got to say what I'm really thinking. And so, um, so I want to say, I want to welcome you, uh, welcome you to boot camp, uh, cause this city needs saving and, uh, sadly you're it. So God has chosen you. God has chosen me. We don't know why we're not going to get too deep into it. We're just glad that he chose us and those whom he chose, he will heal and those who he heals, he will empower. Uh, but it's not about you. It is about the people that God wants us to reach. And, um, so I'm going to do a little boot camp, a little boot camp sermonette. Cause I feel like you need a, uh, you need, uh, a shot with the paddles, you know, the clear, you've been in a summer coma clear. And so let's, um, let's get some resurrection power and resurrection life. And you real quick before you decide your schedule for the rest of the year. Um, we're going to take communion up tonight as well. I want to let you know uh, about that. And, um, I do need to say this, um, a lot of, a lot of new givers, uh, once you start giving your 10th back to God, you will get audited by the government every year. I'm just, I'm just warning you. Cause they're like, people don't give money to stuff that matters anymore. And so every year we get audited. So we got to send our books. I'm just letting you know. So you're like, I'm in trouble with the government. No, you're in trouble with, uh, you got made trouble for the devil and the government just doesn't know yet that like, Hey, so anyways, um, they just want to be like, you can't possibly give that much money away and not spend it all on yourself. And so, uh, it's good though. You know, I, I just imagine those guys sitting in those little dorky offices or whatever they do, whatever they do. And every time I see that, I'd be like, this can't be real. There must be a God in heaven. I don't know whose church they're in, but they're not on this one. All right. Um, Airdrie Fest is this Saturday. Sign up to serve. It is where new people in this city meet uh, their new church friends because they're not going to church yet. And so that's a great place. Venue Church is always there uh, Saturday at 11 until some time. Uh, just secure our code. Sign up to just uh, come there. If, if you're there, just show up and uh, meet some people. It'd be awesome. And Street Fest is coming this week. This is like... There's three like major, major weekends that you invite people to church. You should have invited somebody to church every week, but these are the major ones where they might actually come. Um, it's a fall kickoff because we have a huge thing going on. And then there's Christmas and then there's Easter. We got to get the Christers, everybody. People who go to church at Christmas and Easter. They don't know that you can come every week. <clears throat> and uh, all right. Now this is going to be one of those like little, um, little pieces where, um, where's Cassie and Bruce at? There they are. Cassie comes to me after the service last week and she's like, I am so mad at you. And she was like getting a little, have you seen her? Getting a little, a little crazy. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, here we go. This should be a good one. I'm so mad at you. And she goes off for like 30 seconds, a good strong 30 seconds or a minute. And then she says, how do you know the things that we say, uh, in our home? And I'm like, Text Renee, turn off the recording devices. And that's good stuff. Um, so it turns out that it was like one of those good times, you know, rather than like, we're in, we're leaving this church because you know too much about us. Um, this, um, this message might sound tailored to you, but that's uh, what happens when the Holy Spirit is in charge of his church. And so of course it will sound tailored to you. So th all that to say, don't shoot the messenger because it's just what the Lord showed me to preach to you tonight because you need it. And uh, I would rather preach it to you uh, rather than watch you get hit by the truck in the fall that the enemy is sending. But look, nobody cares about his truck. We've got a big rig that's on the road and we need to get it moving with some Holy Spirit uh, power. So I'm just gonna, gonna give you a little shot of injection tonight. So um, <clears throat> have you ever been in, in church culture? Thanks, Sean. Have you ever been in church cultures and played sports with church people? Okay, so some church cultures, they don't fight the devil. So there's only, uh, the only people left to fight are each other. So, because you were made to fight. I'm going to be talking about that today, by the way. Church people were made to fight. And if you don't fight the devil, you'll fight each other. And so whenever I see somebody who's getting in a squabble with each other, I'm like, uh, maybe you should go invite somebody to church and listen to some real problems. Um, and so I was playing with some church lead guys um, that kind of didn't go to churches that were super engaged in reaching lost people at the time. And, um, and uh, we used to play slow pitch with them in like the beer league. And ours was like the not beer league team and a bunch of Christian guys. And uh, used to be my gym teacher, actually, and uh, his brothers. Now, these guys were like Christians that took um, 
non-competitive sports very competitively. Have you ever been in those guys? There's like a few guys that are like way too serious about what's going on, you know. They're 45, they're playing soccer in town here, and they think that there's a scout from, you know, from England watching, like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draft this kid. Um, these guys were like that. I remember one time getting a lecture, we were playing, we were playing and we used to win all, all the games because we were, you know, we did like to win, but these guys come in and they start in this lecture of like, we're not here to have fun, we're here to win. You know, you ever meet those guys? Like, we have fun when we win. And they're just like yelling up and down this. And I just leaned over to the guy beside me. And I'm like, I was just here to have fun. But I'm feeling like that's not the vibe, you know, we're pick, picking up here. They weren't allowed to cuss because they were church people, right? So they, church people just make up distant, different, you know, so they like slap their gloves off and be like, Judas Priest. <laughs> you ever heard that one? If you come from church culture, Judas Priest. I have been, I've spent like 30 years trying to figure out what that means. Like Judas Iscariot, are they taking Judas's name in vain? But he wasn't a priest. I couldn't figure this out. Or is it Judas Priest? Like, isn't that a, the name of a band? Like, are they saying that? Are they like, I still haven't figured that out. Anyway, so I'm, I was in um, at Providence College where my brother went to, to, um, to Bible college. And I saw a church league having a floor hockey tournament in there. And I'm watching in from the, from the gym window because I was scared to go in there and and these guys, I'm like, these guys are ser- they're taking this seriously. And, and one of his college buddies leans over and says, they're playing for their salvations. <laughs> I thought that explains it. And uh, my brother used to ref that. He said he'd pull guys off of people for punching people in the back of the head. I mean, it's just, it gets serious. Um, a, little, a little too competitive in sports, but a little non-competitive in the war over souls, maybe, in the past in, in church culture in Canada. Um, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, I think this church makes a lot of sense to an unsaved, unchurched person. You come in, you don't really know what's going on, like it's new. But for a, a person, I would say, coming in from a church culture, and I want you to keep your eye out for these people that come in from a church culture that, that look, I'm not bad-mouthing churches at all. I'm just saying some churches are, like, tuned in to, like, lost people and mission, and some churches have kind of forgotten about that. And I'm doing church in the wild coming up here to be like, hey, we got to tune this, we got to tune it up, you know. It's going to sound horrible if we play and we don't tune things in to the mission. And so, but some people come in, they haven't been engaged. They've only been engaged in church politics. And then they come in here and it's super alarming in here because we don't care about politics. We do care about the fight. And so somebody comes in here and they just want to like take it easy for a year. Have you ever said that to yourself? Like, I'm just going to, I'm not going to serve. I got burned out. I always get asked that. How many of your volunteers burned out? I'm like, I don't think any have yet. I don't know. If they do, they don't talk to me about it. <laughs> Serving and getting lost people saved fills my bucket, man. That's the only thing that does it for me. I'm like, oh. So, but anyways, you know, it's alarming to get walk into church and be like, hey, do you got a sword? Because we all should kind of have one. Oh, you got one in there. Let's, it's a little rusty. Let's teach you how to swing it. Let's re-engage you in the fight. Here's what you don't. <laughs> okay, you ready? Spiritual boot camp. Um. Second Timothy two, Paul's talking to a spiritual son. Timothy he says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong in the Lord. Be sorry, be strong through the grace that God gives you through Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Oh my goodness. Okay, con- concentrate. Okay. Uh, you have heard me teach um, things. <laughs> this is not working for me. Okay. You've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to uh, pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good librarian of Christ Jesus. As a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Oh, well, that's a shock for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people, I think some people need to redo their salvation. If you came to Jesus thinking like, hey, everything, you're never going to have any problems anymore. He's like, uh. I came to save you, but not save you from your problems. I came to save you from hell and the effects of sin. In this world, you will have trouble, little children, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'll show you how to do it. So endure suffering along with me as good soldier of Christ. Soldiers don't get, ready? Tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer, Jesus, the captain of the Lord's house. You cannot please the officer who enlisted you. So, Surprise, you're a soldier. Now, this is a spiritual war. This is a spiritual war, and in this particular spiritual war, 
you're either a prisoner or you're a soldier. Now there's two types of soldiers. Either you're a prisoner to sin and the devil and he's your dad or Jesus is your big brother and you are more than a conqueror and you're a soldier in the fight. Now there's two types of soldiers though and two types of Christian soldiers. Are you ready? There are, <laughs> well, here's what I would say. There are no Christian civilians. Not on earth, guys. There's no Christian civilians. There's only two types of soldiers. Soldiers who act like soldiers or soldiers who act like civilians. So that's the problem with some people. You know, I'm trying to, they thought they were coming here to feel good. I'm teaching you how to not die tomorrow and how to save somebody with you. I'm trying to like grab a life jacket. Like somebody's dying on the, well, let's put the oxygen mask on you. Now, are you a Christian soldier pretending to be a civilian who sometimes fights? Because if you like, like, I really like the life of a civilian. Okay, you're in the wrong team. There's only prisoners over there. The civilians are just prisoners. They belong to the devil. We've got to rescue them. But as a, a Christian soldier, you know, if you just show up to fight, at church for one hour a month, you get shot in the face. And everybody around you gets shot in the face. This is a fight that we are in. Oh, it's gonna get worse, all right. Are you a full-time Christian soldier who sometimes goes to the mall? Or are you a mall person who sometimes goes to church and fights? See, soldiers, this is the difference, this is the difference. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to your summer. Soldiers rest so they can fight harder. Civilians rest because they have nothing else to do. But there are no civilians, right? Prisoners get lots of rest. Soldiers rest so they can get back in the fight. Some of you, since I preached the Sabbath message, haven't been observing the Sabbath yet. But you think you're in the fight? You have to honor the Lord on his Sabbath so that he can get you back in the fight because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. And if you try to do it in your flesh, it won't work and your teenager won't come in. It's the anointing of God that breaks the yoke. So our family took a summer break in the summer. Okay, but let me tell you maybe the difference is that we took the break so we could come back and fight harder. That's why we took the break. And it's good to have. You need that break. We, our, our, church, our family needs a Sabbath, too, as far as our family just needs time together because we, we share our family with you, too, so that we can come back and fight, so that we can come back and re-engage in the fight. So, so, but some of us, what we, what we end up doing in the summertime, there's nothing wrong with taking a break. Please hear me. But don't think of it like a civilian summer, like I schedule myself out of the war. You don't get to do that. Schedule yourself out of the wars. Can I say this? It's like picking somebody and saying, okay, you don't get to go to heaven because I scheduled myself out of the war. So pick somebody. You know, when I'm making decisions now, that's the weight on me right now. It's like, who doesn't get to go to heaven? If we can't figure out the next building in time, who doesn't get to go to heaven? So I'm not saying that to be harsh. I'm saying, but in the spirit and anointing of God, we will have everything that we need to do that. But I need you to be a soldier who sometimes goes to the mall, who, a soldier who sometimes works in an office, but you're still a full-time soldier. A soldier who still observes the Sabbath and the day of rest so that we can come back and get in the game and fight. So, so this is what we do though. And here, I'll just, I'll just say this. Sometimes what we do is we schedule ourselves out of the fight in the summer because we think that we need a break. But listen, rest won't fulfill you as a soldier, only soldiering will. So when you take a break, just beware that when you come back, you'll have to make that civilian switch that, no, actually, I'm not a civilian. I'm in the war. Let's go. Because um, rest will not fulfill you. Only the fight will fulfill you. Now, here's what we do, though, is we, we kind of schedule probably too much time, some of you, away in the, in the, from the mission and away from that. And so then we come back, and then we feel a little guilty, and then we feel a little condemned, and we're hungry spiritually, a little disconnected, a little off mission. 
right? And then we decide the schedule for the whole year. Spiritually lightheaded. You know what I mean? If I'm hungry, that's a bad time for me to make decisions, everybody. If I'm hungry and I'm like, got a headache, I got a headache right now. It's not a great time to like hungry, headache. Let's make a bunch of long-term decisions based on my lightheadedness, you know? So what I want to say is come back, get grounded, get back in. Do not make massive scheduling decisions and schedule yourself out of the fight for the year because that's what the devil wants. So here's what I want to say. Come back. Look, you can get rest in the house too. But what I'm saying is like get some counsel. What should we be involved in? What should our kids be involved in? Look, if you schedule yourself out of the fight, the fight will come to you. That's not where you want to fight it. You want to fight on the battlefield in front of you where God has you. So here's, here's the fall boot camp. Let's go back to basic training. You read, remember, remember what it's like to read your Bible every day? Yeah, you used to do that or you wouldn't be married. What changed? You didn't. Read your dang Bible. Read your Bible every day. Go on version Bible app. Friend us. We interact with each other. Bible reading, prayer. If you don't talk to God, you're going to feel disconnected. You ever t- not talk to somebody for a year and be like, I just don't feel connected to them. So they're like, yeah, I've been calling. Right? God is always faithful. He's always there. He wants to connect with you. He loves you. He wants to be with you. Prayer, worship. When worship goes, your sense of awe goes. And when your sense of awe goes, your brain stops working. If you lose your sense of awe, your brain won't function properly. It's science, everybody. Sense of awe. This like, you can't beat an addiction without a sense of awe. You can't figure your way out of sin. A sense of awe that God is here and God is good. And God is here to help you and people are here to help you. That way it will turn out okay. A sense of awe. Bible reading, prayer, worship, corporate church. Something happens here that will not happen anywhere else in this room. God does it because God can. I don't know how it works. I'm not trying to figure it out. I'm just enjoying it. But something happens here where you just get put back into place. It's like a mental reset and a heart reset and an emotional reset. We stop fussing about the stupid stuff that you fuss about. You come in here and you're like, oh, there's more going on than the movie I didn't get to watch. Um, the corporate setting, the anointing of the Lord here. And this is a place that has strong anointing and we don't know why. We just want to live in it and facilitate it. Um, Small groups. If you're not in a small group, you're so easy for the devil to take. You know, he'll leave you alone for a while. As soon as you start backing out of commitment, he'll leave you alone for a bit. Just so you're like, oh yeah, I guess I. I." And then you say to yourself, I guess I didn't need that. And then he's like, perfect. And then your whole life comes tumbling down. But you've already told yourself that you didn't need it. So then what? How does he know? Oh, you're going to get mad at me again? Oh, how did you know the things? No, I'm just kidding. I love you, Cassie. All right. And serving. Serving is the point of all of this. I'm going to be preaching about it on Sunday. Serving is the point of all of this. If you're not serving, what good is health if it's not for helping? It's for helping. Um, now, in, in small groups, this is what we do in small groups. We put the cookies on the bottom shelf. So we're like, hey, we just, want you in, we just want you involved in small groups. So this is what we tell the rest of the church, but you're First Wednesday people. So I'm not going to tell you this. So when you hear this on Sunday, nod and smile and be like, that's what small groups are about. But inside you're like, that's not what he really means. Okay. So here's the cookies on the bottom shelf. In small groups, we're like, hey, in this session of small groups, just do something that you haven't done before. Just grow in your faith in one thing. You got three months. Lift your hands and worship. When I said lift your hands and worship, that meant lift your hands and worship. And you're like, I'm going to decide who I'm going to worship. The pastor just said, lift your hands and worship. Is it really that difficult or are you just really that proud? Okay. Oh, unless you think that worship is for you. Right. Maybe God just likes hands. I don't know why he does. He's like, hey, lift your hands in the sanctuary. Oh, sanctuary hands lift. Okay. I said, I'm not going to say what I say out there. Okay. I'm just like, just lift your hands. You know, like, hey, take three months and lift your hands. Hey, if you've never given anything, you should give something. Hey, if you're giving, but you're not tithing and giving your tenth, hey, why don't you do that in this session of like, hey, maybe you need to get filled with the spirit. Maybe you need to start praying in tongues in your prayer language. Like, do something, do one thing. That's what we say there. Okay, tonight, I'm not going to say that because I don't really mean that. I'm like, hey, that's just my, like, the carrot that I dangle to get you involved, right? It's like, it's like, 
Pastor, how long are you going to be? And I say five minutes. It has never been five minutes. I've never done anything. It's never five minutes. It's always longer. I just don't want you to leave. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm hopeful that it's five minutes, but realistically, it's not going to be five minutes. So ready? Boot camp is not training in one thing. Think about boot camp in army. Good. You know how to clean your rifle. Great. You just got stabbed because you missed knife stabbing class. I can clean a rifle. You eat candy and you weigh a thousand pounds. You're going to die. Like, great that you have a rifle that's perfectly clean. You're not in spiritual shape yet. You got to do all the things in boot camp. Here's what I want to say to you. Don't pick one thing. Pick an entire area of your life in one month. My, you ready? I'm going to lay some out for you. This area needs to get better. See, we can't do this in things like budget because we be, all you do is take one item of your budget that you don't care about anyways and you don't like, or you'll take an item in your wife's budget and be like, we're going we're gonna to stop spending there. <laughs> you know, she's like, what? That's like $15 a month. What about your budget? No. See, a budget and giving is like you got to give and then you got to tighten up all the budget at the same time. That's how you build momentum. Okay, so pick an area of your life. I mean... Look, the devil doesn't care where the leak is if there's a leak in your life. And the blessing's constantly leaking out. He doesn't care where it is. He doesn't care if there's 10 leaks or one leak. So if you've got 10 leaks in an area of your life, fix the leaks, then your cup can be filled. Then you'll be like, oh, this is what it feels like to live sanctified and whole and blessed. And this feels great. Then it's not hard to discipline yourself. It's hard in the beginning because it takes faith to discipline yourself before you see it. But when you see it, it's not hard to read your Bible. So you're like, well, if I don't read my Bible, then I'm a crazy person and nobody likes living with that. <laughs> my kids like Bible reading me. My kids like corporate worship, listening to the word of God, listening to the pastor yell at you and hurt your feelings. My kids love watching me. They're watching me right now. They're teenagers in here watching like, ooh, dad doesn't like this. Boo. <laughs> you're showing them how to respond to correction from you. <sighs> Here's something I'm never going to tell anybody but you. You're in a position of authority. You exercise correction over somebody. The Lord is correcting you in this in, in area of your life at the same time. Always at the same time. Nobody gets to correct somebody without being corrected. That's the price you pay. You want to lead people? You want kids? You want... Where are you being corrected? Who's correcting you? Well, why would they? My kids are the most disobedient. All I'm hearing is I'm the most disobedient person. If they saw you doing it, and if the Spirit of God was moving through the anointing of your submission, where does that look, Pastor? You know where it is. I'm not going to tell you. If you want to give correction, you've got to take correction. That's how anointing works. All right, that's for free. <laughs> you just punched us, and that was for free? It was for free. All right. Um, anger? You have an issue with anger? Let's do, spend a month on that area of your life. Not just anger here, anger. Let's get around it. Let's tackle it. Let's go to the word about anger. Let's pray about anger. Let's get your small group praying about anger. Let's get accountability about anger every time that you blow up. Listen, what happens to you, you can't control. What you do next, you 100% control. Unless Jesus was angry on the cross. But he wasn't. So, if I'm angry, that's my problem. Fire text to Sean, my accountability partner. Pastor Aaron's driving me crazy again. This is all her fault. And I may have said some things that she deserved to hear. Okay. <laughs> and he'll be like, no. And I'll be like, fine. Okay. Here's one. Are you hard to correct? Are you hard to correct? Is the person correcting you enjoying their job? Are you making this an enjoyable experience for them? They're like, oh my goodness, this person is so easy to talk to because every time I correct them, they're just like, oh, thank you so much for saying something. Oh my goodness. You just saved me from making the same mistake over and over again. I'm such a wise person because I love correction so much. You could spend your, your defending time changing if you wanted to. I'm just saying, but you can't do both. As soon as you're like, yeah, but I, oh, geez, you're never going to learn anything. Correction, be easy to correct. Why do you care? Why do you care where it comes from? Why do you care? And I was thinking about this. As servants of Christ, why do I care? 
Why do I care if you're in charge and I'm in charge and you've got to do this and that? I don't care. I don't sign the checks. I just get them. God pays for my living, my life, my sanity. I don't care what I got to do and how I got to help you and who gets to do what. I don't care. I gave that up a long time ago. And I'm in charge, so that helps. I'll bet you I get corrected more than you. Why? Because I get to correct more. I just told you how it works. And you're still like, no, you don't. When you're at the top, you're going to do all the correcting. I just told you. Every time I'm correcting, I get corrected. There's a lot of correct. You're like, you're a bad person. Maybe I am. I get corrected a lot. I'm glad for it. Hopefully I am. Are you lazy? Get around it. Like you wouldn't get up in the morning if you didn't have to. You don't respond promptly to every communication. These are people. I'm like, ah, I'll just leave it. Ah, I'll just. And then you're like, God, give me a responsibility. And he's like, I just give you a friend, and they're not sure that they're your friend because you never respond. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not sure where I stand with this person. You know why you do that? Control, right? Listen, with my staff, I get to do that. I get to, like, if I'm busy and I can't respond in the first, like, 30 seconds that I get something. Why are you laughing about this? <laughs> right, I get to do that. I get to do that. But only because I'm the boss and I have other responsibilities that make, I have to juggle some things sometimes that make all this possible or else we maybe don't do this, right? So, right, but I'll bet you I still respond more promptly than most of you. Why? Because people matter. People matter to me. Relationships matter to me. I'm not going to like just pretend that I don't, some goes down. I'm like, I don't know where it goes. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to dig in and see where it goes. Unless you're a crazy person just firing me weird crap all the time. Then I'm not going to read that. <laughs> Sometimes people do that. They're just like, I'm angry at life. I'm going to take it out on the pastor. Where's his random email? <laughs> Crystal reads all those by the way. So <laughs> I'm like, only send them to me if they're like funny and crazy. You know, just so you know that you can't just like personally attack me about something. Like, no, other people see that stuff, right? So mind your manners. It's like, it's mind your manners. And it is smart. Thank you, Jen. Let's just be civil with each other and play well. Okay, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> Insecurity is a sin for a soldier. These notes I wrote before you had your problems. <laughs> it's a sin for a soldier. Insecurity is when you lack the relationship or the competence. Well, luckily, you can fix both of those. You don't know who you are in Christ yet? Well, go find out. You think it's God's problem to fix your insecurity? Tell you what, proximity will fix it. You spend around God all the time and hear how much you're loved all the time, but if you never read the Bible, of course you'll be insecure. You must enjoy it. You don't have to be insecure. Go out and find out who you are. Go to your small girl leader. Ask them who you are. Oh, you'll hear, actually, I see this in you. Actually, I see this in you. Oh, but then you got to build competence. Right? Sons of God can't just be totally incompetent and be secure at the same time. That got super quiet. Why is that weird? You never thought of insecurity as a sin, did you? You thought somebody did it to you. Sorry, the hurt that your dad did to you is greater than what God can do? Your dad is... The devil is bigger than God. You think, that, you think that the plans that the devil wrote for you can't be totally undone by the power of God? I feel like you're in the wrong place here. Well, go to God and see what he'll do. Go to God and see what he says. Okay. Uh, authority problems? Take a month and go at it. You know how you go at it? I always, I always enjoy people who are trying to like fix authority problems by themselves. That's why you have a problem with authority. See, I haven't seen the blessing that God uses people in authority to bless you and to help you. The government, I'm like, well, it says that God's still, they're still in place and he still has a plan. Do you trust in God? I think that's really the problem. But I mean, if you're in the church, I mean, this church loves you and Authority. You want to fix authority? Get next to a person with authority who will ask you to do stuff that you don't want to do. That'll fix it. Or you'll leave and send me a long email that I won't read and Crystal will. <laughs> no, I'm just telling you how it works. I didn't used to love authority. I love it now. It's my lifeline now. 
I would never have it any other way now because life outside of authority is hard. I'm constantly thinking too much. I think people think too much. All right. Now, I want to just address one more thing before we do communion, and that is this. There's only so much time and medical con- um, attention in like a, an army hospital. Who do you think gets fixed? The soldiers who have another mission tomorrow or the soldiers who are quite enjoyed summer vacation and want the rest of the year to be vacation too. So who do you think God fixes? Because I've watched people come to the house of the Lord for healing, but not for purpose. And then they lost their healing eventually because they took their healing and they ran. And I'm like, but that wasn't for you. Health is for helping. Health is for helping. Health is for helping. I would wager that you'll get healed just prior to your next mission. God can't afford you being out there broken around, you know, being broken, trying to help people at that. You might walk with a limp. That'll bring humility. But you won't. He's got to have you somewhat fixed and somewhat healthy to be helping people, right? I'll bet you when you start serving people, you start getting fixed in those areas. Because God doesn't want you diseased people helping diseased people, you know? It's like, ah, actually, then you step out on faith, God meets you there, and then just before you need to get on the platform and preach, God, just before you get to the, your neighbors with cookies and, and they just lost their child, and just before you get there, oh, all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's worth pushing through a headache. It's worth, worth pushing through a physical infirmity. Right now, everything in Canada is telling you, like, you can't do it if you're hurt. I'm saying that's pointless pain. Completely pointless pain. I think you can do it hurt. I think if it's worth doing, it's worth doing hurt. But I think God fixes the hurt. Right. Um, as we take up communion tonight, do we, do we, have we passed it out? Is it under everybody's chair? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, team, for doing that. Um, communion is not just to feel close to Jesus. It's to remind you of something. Are you ready? Um, 1 Corinthians... On the night he was betrayed, on the night he was betrayed, on the night Jesus was betrayed, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is real wine, everybody, so get into it. Um, it is not. I want to say some names out there, but I'm not going to. Okay. On the night he was betrayed, who was Jesus betrayed by? Somebody, a soldier with a civilian mindset. Judas. You remember Judas? A girl comes in, like, pours out this extremely expensive, like, annual income expensive anointing oil on Christ. And Judas is just indignant. You know who gets maddest about the church budget? People who don't give anything. So angry. So angry. This could have been sold and given to the poor. But then the Bible says he didn't do it because he cared about the poor. He did it because he used to steal from the offering plate. A soldier who forgot. This isn't for your lifestyle. This is for the war. This is for the war effort. This is for the rescue mission. This isn't to pad your pocket. He sells Jesus, the son of the living God, for 30 pieces of silver. He put a price tag on Jesus, who didn't put a price tag on you. A soldier with a civilian mindset. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. On the night he was betrayed... He wasn't doing that well. In the garden, sweating great drops of blood. His own disciples couldn't even stay awake. I'm going to be talking about Jesus' small group. Whatever small group you pick is going to be better than his small group. (laughs) On that night, he's like, can you stay up with me? Please just stay up with me one hour. And they're just (laughs) like, hey, where are you? He's sweating blood. He comes back. You know what I'm saying? So it was a tough night for him. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and he said, hey, I'm still on mission. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people. I'm going to finish what I started. I'm going to finish the mission that I'm on. I'm broken. I'm betrayed. None of y'all are going to stay with me tonight. And I'm still going to do it for you. 
Well, I can't do that because my work betrayed me. Great, get back in there tomorrow. Because on the same night he was betrayed, he still did his mission. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You are announcing that he came, and as a good soldier, he completed his mission, no matter the cost. And now he lives in glory. I don't want to get there and be like, I had it as easy as I wanted it down there. I already live in an easy country. Oh, God, let this mission not be easy. How many people don't get to go to heaven? I want to get there as somebody that Jesus can be like, yeah, he lived in a soft country, but he wasn't soft. He lived in a country with no purpose, but he had loads of purpose. In a country with no vision, but he had more vision than he could do in his lifetime, so he trained up a people who could carry the vision on. We're only going to get to the first part of it. Maybe. Maybe. Tonight, can we exercise faith and bring an offering before we ask for the healing? So this is to remember the Lord, but it's also to bring a sacrifice to the Lord. What one thing? What one thing? The Lord, you know the Lord's calling for one thing. I need to be a better wife. I need to be a better dad. Okay. One thing, hammer it for a month and see if the Lord doesn't do something. This is not cookies on the bottom shelf. This is steak and potatoes or vegetables or whatever you're into. Let's go and let's get healthy and let's help people. Lord, we remember as we take the bread together, we remember that maybe you've taken it already. I wasn't very clear about that. <laughs> we remember the broken body of Christ reminding us that in our brokenness, we are strong. As we partake of the blood of Jesus, symbolic of his sacrifice for us, he was willing to bleed for his mission and his mission was us. Let our mission be the same mission as our Lord Jesus. Come on up, worship team.